Hi guys, in this video I'm going to talk about fitted values and residuals of time series analysis and of forecasts. So using any forecasting method, including the baseline method that I've explained in a previous video, will result in having residuals on our training data, on the data that we actually have. For example, using the naive method, suppose our data is indexed with a small t ranging from one till capital T, then we can forecast for t equal two till t equal capital T and get t minus one, what is called fitted value. So these are the values outputted by the model for each time step ranging from two till capital T. So for example, y hat two will be equal to y one, the previous value, y hat three will be equal to y two, and y hat t capital T will be equal to uh, y t minus one. And we can use these fitted values uh, to get residuals. So a residual at time t will be equal to the real value at time t minus the fitted value at time t, the value that our model forecasted uh, using all data until that time. And note that there's some distinction between what is called innovation residuals and residuals. Uh, if we don't transform the data, they are the same. But if we transform the data, so for example, if we take wt to be some function f of y of t, then wt minus the fitted wt, these are called the innovation residuals and the reverse transformation. So yt minus the reverse transformation of um, the wt hat, these are called the residuals. Now, if our model is correct, the residuals should have no information. So if our model is correct, the real value at time t should be equal to the uh, model value of time t plus some white noise, plus some measurement error or some general randomness in the process. And so it contains no signal information. So checking the residuals can be a good diagnostic tool for the model validity. So if it still contains information, for example, we might see that the mean of the residuals are not zero or that there is some correlation between the residuals and that means that we can improve the model and the forecast. But this is just a sanity check. Uh, this is not the way to choose the best model as many models might have non-informative residuals. Okay, so once we have the fitted values and the residuals, we can also create prediction intervals for our forecasting. But we need to assume a few more things. One is almost catasticity, meaning that the variance uh, at time t is equal to the variance at uh, time s, which is constant. A second thing is that there's no correlation between these white noise, between the residuals, yeah? That they are not correlated with each other. And the third assumption is normality. That's yeah? so that uh, the residual or this error term, it distributes normal with a mean zero and a constant variance. We need the first and the second assumption to estimate the variance and third, to get a prediction interval. Yeah, so for example, if we want a 95% prediction interval, then this corresponds to 1.96 in a standard normal distribution. So we need to assume some distribution in order to get this, um, this band, this interval length. So we first estimate the variance and we estimate it uh, quite similarly to how we usually estimate the variance. We take the average of the square residuals, but we adjust for any parameters estimated in our models. Uh, but note that we also have some missing values. So for example, for the naive forecast, we won't have capital T uh, number of residuals. We will only have T minus one because we don't have a forecast for the first time step. So some forecasting method We'll have some missing values and we have to adjust for it. And P is the number of parameters estimated in the model. So for example, for naive or seasonal naive, it's zero, there are no parameters, but for the mean or drift, we have a parameter to estimate. And so it's one. And of course, more complicated models will have more parameters. So now that we have the variance of these epsilon Ts and we estimated the variance of this process, uh, we can get a one-step prediction interval. So the mean will be the forecast itself. And if we want a 95% prediction interval, uh, this will mean that it will be plus minus 1.96 times the standard deviation, the square root of this, basically. Now, what about H steps forecast? 
So let's look. In the naive, we are saying that this is what happens at t plus 1, capital T plus 1. Then at capital T plus 2, it's equal to this. But if we plug this in, we get this thing over here. Basically, uh, each time step that we are going, we are adding uh, this error term. Okay, and in the end, after h time steps, we'll have h error terms. So the mean uh, will be the same because these error terms have a zero mean, but the variance will grow. The variance will grow because they are uncorrelated. The variance will be this thing over here. So if now we want to take a prediction interval, it will be plus minus 1.96 for 95% prediction interval times this variance at time step h forecasting h steps ahead. So we need to take the square root of this, which will be this thing over here. So this was for the naive method. What about the mean method? The mean method, the mean forecast have this model. And so we have one parameter which we are estimating, which is the mean. And once we estimate it, we can take the expectation of this, and of course, the expectation of the sample mean is the true mean. The variance of this is equal to the variance of this, which is equal to the variance, which is equal to the variance of the sample average plus the variance of the new uh, error term. The variance of the sample average is just this. This is for the new sample term. And note that the reason why we can break this is because there's no correlation between C and epsilon T plus H because C only depends on previous values uh, up to up to value capital T. So it will only have epsilons up to that. It won't have more. Okay, so this is the variance. And we see that for the mean, it doesn't grow with H, unlike the naive method, which grew with H. So the further down that we are forecasting, the bigger the prediction interval. Here, the prediction interval doesn't grow. And this is what we get. And so this was an analytical way of calculating prediction intervals for two models. We could also do it for the drift model and for the seasonal naive. There's also what is called bootstrapping. In bootstrapping, uh, it, we don't have to assume normality. We still have to assume that the residuals are uncorrelated with a constant variance. So basically the first and second assumptions that we made. We also assume that future errors will be similar to past errors. Basically that the same process continues and it's not a different process at some point. And so what we can do is simply sample from the past residuals that we already have. So for example, we assume that uh, the value at t plus 1 is equal to the model at t plus 1, so to the forecast, plus some new noise, right? So this thing is a one-step forecast. This is an unknown future error, but we can replace it with a sample from the previous residuals. And so we can do this also for t plus 2, t plus 3, et cetera, et cetera, and get a possible trajectory of the forecast. We can repeat this many times. So for example, if we want this until, until t plus h, uh, we can do this and get a trajectory of the forecast. Then we can repeat this many times. We, can, we got one trajectory using one sample of the residuals. Let's sample again. Let's do the process again. We get a new trajectory. And we do this many times, maybe a hundred, a thousand, more. Uh, I'm sorry, this is wrong. So we can repeat this many times, get many trajectories, and then use the percentiles, and then use empirical percentiles to create the prediction interval. So, so for a given time step, we might have a thousand different values that we got from the thousand trajectories that we uh, sampled. And so we can just see, well, what is uh, the value that 97.5% uh, is above that value? And what is the value that only 2.5% are above that value? And these will be the two, and these will be the lower and the upper bounds of our, our prediction intervals. So let's switch into R. I'm going to generate data from a naive model. So basically from a random walk. Okay, a random walk which has a sigma of three. So the uh, error term has a variance of nine and a standard deviation of three. And this is how it looks. This is how the data that I generated looks. And now we can calculate residuals using the naive forecast. So basically uh, the forecast for each time step will be 
the last time steps, this is the fitted value. And then the residuals is simply the current value, the real value minus the fitted value. Okay, so we do that. And we can now estimate the variance. Uh, we all, we only have to subtract one missing value. We don't have any parameters for this model, so we don't, we don't have to subtract that. And we see we got 2.82, which is close to three, which is the real sigma, right? Okay, and now let's calculate a forecast for an horizon of 20. And so in a naive forecasting, we simply re repeat the last value the whole way through. And now we can calculate a 95% prediction interval. So it will be a 1.96 times the square root for each of h, right? And here h will go, here h is i, and it goes from 1 until h. OK, and this is time the sigma hat. Again, this is equal to this thing over here. OK, and we can do that and get the lower and upper bounds. And we can plot this with base r like this or in a modern way using the FPP3 library, casting the data as at Siebel, uh, using the forecast and asking for a prediction interval with 95%. So this is what will be. And we get this graph over here and it should be the same, only the difference is, is that it just grew a bit, okay? And we could also use bootstrapping. So the only difference that we have to do is when we say forecast, we also say, uh, use bootstrapping to calculate the lower and upper bounds of the prediction intervals. And then we say plot it. And yeah, I don't know if you can see it, but it's a bit more jagged. Okay. So before we had like this perfectly curved uh, line, which is, which corresponds to the square root of H. So because the square root is like this, also the prediction interval looked like this. And here we have some, uh, it's more jagged. There's more it's not as smooth as before. This is because of the sampling. So um, there are difference in the sampling of the trajectories. But overall, it looks pretty much the same shape as before. Okay, so this is all for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it and see you in the next one.